From New York, this is Democracy Now! Now, with that shining example before me, and with God's help, I take up my new duties resolved to seek the welfare of all the inhabitants of Northern Ireland. As tens of thousands line the streets of London to watch the procession carrying the casket of Queen Elizabeth II, her son, now King Charles III, is just back from Northern Ireland, where more than 3,600 people died over three decades of the Queen's reign in fighting between the Irish Republican Army and forces backed by Britain. We'll look at the monarch's legacy with Irish journalist Eamon McCann in Derry, Northern Ireland. Then, the storm is here, an American crucible. For my book, uh, The Storm is Here, an American Crucible, I tried to chronicle uh, the trajectory of the evolution of, of, of this radical right movement from uh, frustration with COVID-19 policies to uh, militarized opposition to demands for racial justice to a stop the steal movement in the wake of the election to an organized uh, crusade against democracy. We'll speak with Luke Mogelson, the New Yorker magazine's award-winning war correspondent who covered the wars in Afghanistan, in Syria, and Iraq before returning to the United States in 2020 to write about right-wing extremism. He was there on January 6th when Trump supporters forced their way into the Senate chamber. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Ukraine is claiming it's recaptured over 3,000 square miles of territory from Russia during a counteroffensive largely targeting the Kharkiv region. Earlier today, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky visited the city of Izium, which Ukrainian forces retook over the weekend. Despite Ukraine's advances, Russia still occupies about a fifth of Ukrainian territory. On Tuesday, President Biden declined to say if he saw Ukraine's latest offensive as a turning point in the war. It's clear the Ukrainians have made significant progress. I think this could be a long haul. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina has introduced legislation to ban abortions nationwide after 15 weeks of pregnancy. Here's what I think. I think we should have a law at the federal level that would say, after 15 weeks, no abortion on demand, except in cases of rape, incest, to save the life of the mother. And that should be where America's at. Senator Graham's nationwide abortion ban proposal shocked many in Washington, including some Republicans, who say the issue should be addressed by states, not the federal government. Under Graham's bill, states could still impose harsher bans on abortion. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi tweeted Tuesday, quote, the nationwide abortion ban proposal put forward today is the latest, clearest signal of extreme MAGA Republicans' intent to criminalize women's health freedom in all 50 states and arrest doctors for providing basic care, she said. In West Virginia, lawmakers have passed a near-total ban on abortion. If Republican Governor Jim Justice signs the bill as expected, West Virginia will become the second state after Indiana to enact a new abortion ban following the Supreme Court's overturning of Roe. Republican lawmakers said they hope the bill results in the closure of West Virginia's only abortion clinic. Indiana's near-total abortion ban goes into effect Thursday. 
Voters went to the polls in New Hampshire, Rhode Island and Delaware Tuesday for the final primaries before the November 8th midterm elections. The closely watched Republican Senate primary in New Hampshire is too close to call. With about 85 percent of the vote counted, retired Army Brigadier General Don Bolduc has a narrow lead over New Hampshire State Senate President Chuck Morse. Bolduc is a far-right Trump supporter, who's echoed the former president's false claims that the 2020 election was stolen. During a previous run for office, he decried his opponents as, quote, liberal socialist pansies. According to the group Open Secrets, the Senate Majority PAC and the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee spent nearly $3.3 million helping Bolduc in his race against Morse. The winner of the race will face incumbent Democratic Senator Maggie Hassan in November. Meanwhile, former Trump staffer Carolyn Levitt has won the Republican primary in New Hampshire's first congressional district. The 25-year-old has also claimed Trump won the 2020 election. She defeated another former Trump aide, Matt Mowers, who had been endorsed by prominent Republicans, including House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. According to the website 538.com, there will about 200 Republicans on the ballot in November who have fully denied the legitimacy of the 2020 election. On Capitol Hill, Democrat Mary Peltola has been sworn in as Alaska's new representative in Congress after she beat Sarah Palin in a special election last month. Peltola, who is Yupik, is the first Alaska native to serve in Congress. It is the honor of my life to represent Alaska, a place my elders and ancestors have called home for thousands of years, where to this day many people in my community carry forward our traditions of hunting and fishing. I am humbled and deeply honored to be the first Alaska native elected to this body, the first woman to hold Alaska's House seat. But to be clear, I'm here to represent all Alaskans. Peltola won in a ranked choice election. In other news from Capitol Hill, a new investigation by The New York Times has found at least 97 current members of Congress or their close family members have bought or sold stock or other investments that intersected with their legislative committee work. One case highlighted by The New York Times involves House Democrat Alan Lowenthal of California, who serves on the House Transportation Committee. In 2020, his wife sold shares of Boeing one day before the the committee released a damning report about problems with Boeing 737 MAX jet. In London, thousands of people are lining the streets to watch a procession carrying the casket of Queen Elizabeth II from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall, where her body will lie in state until her state funeral on Monday. We'll go to Northern Ireland after headlines to look at how the Queen is remembered there, just after the King's visit. Labor Secretary Marty Walsh is meeting with railroad companies and top union officials today as more than 110,000 rail workers threaten to go on strike Friday to protest deteriorating working conditions. A strike could disrupt supply chains nationwide. On Tuesday, White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre said the Biden administration is working on plans if a strike begins. We are working with other modes of transportation, including uh, the shippers and truckers, air, air, freight, uh, air freight, to see how they can step in and keep goods moving uh, in case of, of this rail shutdown. Uh, the administration has also been working with relevant agencies to assess what supply chains and commodities are, are most likely to face severe uh, disruptions and available authorities uh, to keep goods moving. In other labor news, teachers in Seattle, Washington, have voted to suspend their five-day strike. Schools are scheduled to reopen today after a tentative agreement was reached between the school system and the Seattle Education Association. William Ruto has been sworn in as Kenya's new president following last month's election. Last week, the Kenyan Supreme Court rejected a challenge from his opponent, Nurela Odinga. On Tuesday, Ruto vowed to confront the climate crisis. Among the central concerns 
of my government will be climate change. In our country, women and men, young people, farmers, workers, and local communities suffer the consequences of climate emergency. It is not too late to respond. To tackle this threat, we must act urgently to keep global heating levels below the 1.5 Celsius, help those in need, and end addiction to fossil fuels. In Pakistan, the death toll has topped 1,400 from catastrophic flooding that's left a third of the country underwater and devastating key agricultural areas. Authorities now say it could take six months for the water to recede in some areas, more rains forecast in parts of Pakistan. Authorities are also racing to protect a key power plant uh, in the north of Karachi that provides power to millions of people, patients and makeshift hospitals say they're getting sick from a lack of drinkable water. Floods inundated our homes and we came down here. The water which is supplied through the water tanker here is not clean. The children are falling sick by drinking this water. They suffer from cold, cough and skin problems. There are no good arrangements for drinking water here. Twitter's former security chief testified before Congress Tuesday and warned of major security flaws on the social media platform. Peter Mudge Zadko told lawmakers that China and India had agents working inside Twitter and that the company's security protocols were inadequate. What I discovered when I joined Twitter was that this enormously influential company was over a decade behind industry security standards. The company's cybersecurity failures make it vulnerable to exploitation, causing real harm to real people. And when an influential media platform can be compromised by teenagers, thieves, and spies, and the company repeatedly creates security problems on their own, this is a big deal for all of us. The right-wing conspiracy theorist Alex Jones is on trial again, this time in Connecticut, for claiming the 2012 Sandy Hook mass shooting was a hoax. Last month, a jury in Texas ordered Jones to pay nearly $50 million to a Sandy Hook family. Now a jury is hearing a case brought by 13 family members of victims and an FBI agent who accused Jones of defamation. And former independent counsel Ken Starr has died at the age of 76. In the 90s, the right-wing judge headed an investigation of President Bill Clinton that led to Clinton's impeachment in 1998. Starr later served as president of Baylor University. He resigned in 2016 over the university's cover-up of rape and sexual assault by football players. He also served on the defense team for sex offender Jeffrey Epstein and for Blackwater mercenaries accused of killing civilians in Iraq. In 2020, Ken Starr joined Donald Trump's defense team during Trump's first impeachment trial. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. Coming up, we look at the new king, uh, King Charles III's visit to Northern Ireland and the history of British colonialism in Northern Ireland. Stay with us. Have no thought of ever returning. 
Gloomy Sunday version by Sinead O'Connor. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, as thousands of people line the streets of London to watch the procession carrying the casket of Queen Elizabeth II from Buckingham Palace to Westminster Hall, where her body will lie in state until her state funeral Monday, we begin today's show looking at the monarch's legacy in Ireland. King Charles III was just in Northern Ireland Tuesday as part of his tour of sorrow after the death of his mother. He spoke in Hillsborough, Northern Ireland. My mother felt deeply, I know, the significance of the role she herself played in bringing together those whom history had separated and in extending a hand to make possible the healing of long-held hurts. At the very beginning of her life of service, the Queen made a pledge to dedicate herself to her country and her people and to maintain the principles of constitutional government. This promise she kept uh, with steadfast faith. Now, with that shining example before me and with God's help, I take up my new duties resolved to seek the welfare of all the inhabitants of Northern Ireland. During the Queen's reign, more than 3,600 people died over three decades in Northern Ireland in fighting between the Irish Republican Army and forces backed by Britain. In 1979, an IRA bombing killed Lord Louis Mountbatten, the Queen's second cousin. In 2012, the Queen famously shook hands with former IRA leader and Sinn Féin politician Martin McGuinness in Belfast. Last week, Sinn Féin leader Michelle O'Neill paid tribute to the Queen. There's no doubt that she leaves a legacy of someone who reached out the hand of friendship, someone who advanced peace and reconciliation, someone who sought to build relations between those of an Irish and those of a British identity. And I think that was sterling work and something that I think that she'll be very much remembered for here on this island. This comes as King Charles III visited Belfast Tuesday and met with members of Sinn Féin, which is now the largest party in Ireland after elections in May, where response to the Queen's death has been mixed. For more, we're joined by Eamon McCann, journalist, writer, activist in Derry, Northern Ireland. Eamon is a former member of the Northern Ireland Assembly. He also took part in the March on Bloody Sunday in 1972 and helped form the Bloody Sunday Trust. His 1974 book, War and an Irish Town, was recently republished. Eamon McCann, welcome back to Democracy Now! For people who aren't familiar with the struggle, if you can lay out the history of the monarchy and Northern Ireland. Well, the history of the monarchy in Northern Ireland is a somewhat ambivalent one. I mean, of course, the vast majority of unionist people are overwhelmingly Protestant. The Protestant unionist community has traditionally worshipped a, the royal family has been a symbol of their desire to be part of the United Kingdom rather than move into a united Ireland. So the Queen has been a figurehead for them, sort of, and an icon, if you like, uh, a, of Britishness. So their fervour for the Queen, fervour of Northern Ireland Protestant Unionists, has, if anything, been much more intense sort of than the fervour of a, the majority of the British citizens across the water. A, you know, and a, 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 after the formation, after partition in Ireland in 1922, almost exactly 100 uh, years ago, uh, the royal family really hinted or said outright on some occasions that they really sort of were, I uh, didn't reciprocate the loyalty which Protestant unionists in Northern Ireland showed uh, towards them. When the Northern Ireland Parliament at the Stormont in Belfast, when the Stormont Parliament was opened in 1922, it was opened by George V, the monarch, came across uh, and spoke. And during that speech, 
he expressed a hope that there would be reconciliation between all factions in Ireland and that the uh, disputes over sovereignty and the antagonism between Catholics and Protestants in the North, he expressed the hope way back in 1922 that this could be erased. And it is, there's many perspectives in which you can see the events of the last couple of days, but it is, I think, politically meaningful to look at it and say, well, there is that royal family project according, brought to fruition by, not by Queen Elizabeth, but by the death of uh, Queen Elizabeth, when once again, that the uh, royal family is associating itself to some extent, they wouldn't exaggerate this, but is certainly associating itself with uh, advocates for a united Ireland. And this is bound to cause over the coming weeks and months considerable confusion and dismay among the unionist population of the North and a certain if there's such a thing, ambivalent euphoria <laughs> among Catholic nationalists, you will see, in effect, what they see as the endorsement of the campaign for a united Ireland by the British royal family as a major step towards a united Ireland and a way sort of of leaving the unionist population sort of in the past, in history. Now, that's a very initial judgment. Obviously, these gestures by Prince Charles, uh, King Charles, sorry, I mean, have only come sort of in the last week since, uh, his mo since the death of uh, his mother. And we have to see how they play out. But certainly, I would say that at this point, sort of in less than a week after the death of the Queen, Irish nationalists are much more content with what has been happening than the traditionally loyal royalists that are of the unionist population. So that's a, a turn up for the books, if you like. Certainly, it's a significant turning point sort of in attitudes in Northern Ireland and in both communities in Northern Ireland towards the monarchy. This could turn out to be very significant, or it could turn out to be a brief moment sort of which passes uh, when it's undermined by events over the, in the next uh, a, a, a near future. And and Amy McCann following oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Amy McCann following that up the um, the uh, the change in uh, in perspective and attitude of uh, Sinn Fein uh, toward the monarchy. I mean, clearly uh, from uh, the, the 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 bombing that killed uh, Lord Mountbatten in 1979 to the handshake of uh, Martin McGuinness in 2012 with the Queen, and now with uh, Michelle O'Neill, the current Sinn Féin leader paying tribute to the Queen. Does, does this view of how the monarchy may be uh, uh, taking a, a position quite distinct from uh, the elected leaders of, uh, of, of uh, the United Kingdom, uh, part of the reason why Sinn Féin has uh, taken such a much more um, uh, open view toward the monarchy? Yes, I, I think that's true. And I think it's, in order to set the context for, for that, it's uh, important to understand that the majority of people in Britain sort of, uh, have never actually felt a sense of kith and kin with the Northern Unionists here. I worked for seven years in London. So then in all that time, I worked as a labourer, so I wasn't moving in elite, cir uh, a, a, in elite circles. And I, I don't think I ever met a single person who thought that a Northern Ireland was part of their country. They had no sense of kith and kin with the uh, Unionists of uh, Northern Ireland. I recall one of my workmates sort of turning to me and saying, look, just explain to me, which part of Ireland do we own? And for a London labourer to ask you that tells you a great deal about the perception of English people towards uh, their, uh, the Protestant people of Northern Ireland. The loyalty of loyalists in Northern Ireland has never been reciprocated by the British people. And indeed, there is good evidence to believe in the uh, historical records, you know, that British politicians never really were concerned about bringing Northern Ireland with them. So, you know, the unionists who believe in, the, uh, uh, in themselves being part of the United Kingdom and who have ferocious loyalty to uh, the British monarchy. They must be in a state of confusion, sort of, uh, and fear would be putting it too strongly, but certainly they are anxious about their future as British unionists in the future as we move to constitutional talks. And I wanted to ask you about, uh, James Connolly was an uh, Irish Republican socialist and trade mm. union leader over 100 years ago. Back in 1911, mm. he wrote a piece titled, The British Monarchy is an Affront to Democracy. Uh, could, mm. uh, what is the your view in terms of the monarchy itself? 
uh, and uh, and the possibilities of that being raised now for the first time to consider the uh, ending the monarchy. Well, I think that the uh, argument about the monarchy and the uh, viability and acceptability of the uh, monarchy is beginning to be discussed. Uh, right across Britain. And uh, I, of course, it's very early days yet, but of course, uh, Queen Elizabeth, uh, for 70 years, I mean, was the only queen, the only uh, head of the monarchy that anybody in these islands had ever known. So it's a, a, her position wasn't really an occasion for controversy. It became like the wallpaper. It was just there, and events happened uh, uh, in, in, in uh, front of it. But the... Uh, it's very doubtful, very doubtful indeed, whether King Charles, as he now is, King Charles III, will ever sort of attain that sort of more or less automatic loyalty sort of the population of Britain. Forget about Northern Ireland and the island of Ireland. In Britain, I think it's going to be more easy, but it, it more easy for uh, anti-monarchists to make their case because they won't be dealing sort of with that uncritical reverence which was directed towards a uh, 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 Queen Elizabeth. And we've also got at the moment you, there's a little hint of what might be happening even today. I mean, we've learned sort of that at the laying in state, or whatever the phrase is, of the Queen's uh, body, sort of at Westminster Hall, we're going to see uh, Prince Harry, of course, who made the big mistake, as far as the royals are concerned, of marrying sort of an American divorcee of colour, uh, and she's been uh, frozen out, sort of, in general terms. Uh, uh, but Prince Harry is not going to be wearing his military uniform as he stands at his uh, 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 grandmother's uh, a casket, uh, whereas Prince Andrew, the uh, good friend of Jeffrey Epstein, and a man who, in the eyes of the British people, as of most people around the world, is entirely discredited. You know, uh, he's going to be there playing a prominent role, you know, and it's already been announced that he will fill in for King Charles III on some ceremonial occasions in the future. So he hasn't gone away, you know, uh, Prince Andrew, and it will be interesting to see what the attitude uh, uh, of people is to the growing debate about the royal family when they factor in the presence and gaudy array of uh, uh, Prince Andrew. A... Uh, He's a big embarrassment to the royal family, although he hasn't been frozen out in the way that Meghan Markle has and in the way that Prince Harry uh, is beginning to be frozen out sort of by the British establishment. So interesting times to come. We'll have to see how all that works out. Uh, and just to be clear, Meghan Markle, who leveled charges of racism against the royal family, and Prince yeah. Andrew, who paid yeah. out a multi-million dollar settlement in a uh, sexual assault case involving 12, uh, himself 12, related yeah. to Jeffrey Epstein. Yes, and it should be remembered that, you know, Prince Andrew, like the rest of the rest, doesn't really have money of his own. That was paid by the royal estate, by his mother. And the total sum that he given to Andrew to pay off his accusers and get him off the hook for uh, being an associate and a co-participant with uh, Jeffrey Epstein and various sort of sordid and discreditable uh, episodes, £12 million of British taxpayers' money was paid to get uh, Prince Andrew uh, off the hook uh, uh, for all that. Now, we'll see when Prince Andrew appears sort of in his royal regalia and his military uniform, you know, dripping with medals and regimental colours, when he appears in Westminster Abbey with, uh, with that. I think it will tinge sort of the uh, majesty uh, of, the, of, the, of the event and majesty of the royal funeral. Already we've heard sort of people shouting sort of from crowds in Britain at a Prince Andrew, as the royal procession has trapezed from one place to another sort of over the last uh, uh, few days, and people should be nonce uh, aimed, uh, at him and get out of it. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. But of course, the Queen stood by Andrew. She never publicly endorsed what he had done, but stood by him and had him to Buckingham Palace and all, uh, uh, and all that. But it's a bit early to write the history sort of, of how that will affect the standing uh, 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 of the monarchy generally in Britain. But it's going to be one to watch. And speaking of money, the uh, uh, 
future king, uh, Prince William, is, if there is one, has just inherited a billion-dollar estate, the Duchy of Cornwall. Um, the Duchy owns a sprawling portfolio of land and property covering 140,000 acres, most of it in southwest England. But I wanted to ask you, Eamon, about 1972, about Bloody Sunday, for people to understand uh, the relationship between Britain and Northern Ireland. You were there. I was there, and I, I mean, explain what happened. At the end of, well, there was a civil rights march in Derry, uh, January the 30th, 1972, in which about 10,000 people marched. They were marching against uh, the military presence in Northern Ireland, and specifically for the rights of people. It was a civil rights march. It wasn't a Republican march. It was broad a, a support. And at the end of that march, it came into the, the bog side, where I am now, which is a Catholic, working-class, nationalist area, overwhelmingly. Uh, and as the march came in and prepared for a meeting, I mean, Bernadette Devlin, whose name might ring a bell with some uh, uh, people who are, are watching, she was about to speak. Uh, people will be here, the crack, crack of rifles coming from about 150 yards away at the bottom of Rossville Street. And I remember well that, that happening and uh, myself and thousands of others taking a few seconds, I mean, to realise that what was happening was that British soldiers were shooting at us. The Paratroop Regiment, or members of the 2nd, 1st, sorry, 1st Battalion of the Parachute Regiment, had come in behind the march as it came into the bog side and people stopped and assembled a, 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 to hear a, pub, a, a, a public meeting to be addressed by Bernadette Devlin and, and a, others. And, of course, 13 people were killed and other 13 a, a, were wounded. That was carried out. That massacre was carried out, as I say, by members of the Parachute Regiment, of which, as he then was, the Prince of Wales, i.e. King uh, Charles III, he was the commander-in-chief of that regiment. So when Republicans now move to make peace and they met with uh, uh, King Charles yesterday in very friendly terms and so forth, that's some sort of savage contradiction to the rule sort of of uh, a, the monarchy or the troops on the, a, a operating under the monarch's name, or the rule that they had played back then. So there has been, you know, a seismic and very uh, a dramatic change sort of in the way uh, Republicans, for example, in Sinn, the Sinn Féin party are willing to see sort of uh, uh, a, a, the British monarchy and relations with Britain a, a generally. A, 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 just 10 years ago, stop me if I'm going on too long, sort of, <laughs> in, uh, uh, in these answers. A, 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 it's just 10 years ago that a, a, the Queen Mother a, a died, i.e. the mother sort of, of uh, a Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, and she died, the, uh, the, a, the leader of the moderate Nationalist Party in Europe, Sinn Féin's moderate rivals, the Social Democratic and Labour Party, they expressed condolences. And the denunciation of them by Sinn Féin was ferocious to listen to and made many members of the SDLP to wilt. This name, Social Democratic and Labour Party, SDLP, was uh, on placards and sort of in a slogans on gable walls. Sort of Sinn Féin turned it into SDLP, the Stoop Down Low Party, for doing what Sinn Féin has done over this last few days. So, you know, sort of, that's for complicated and subtle reasons. You know, it's a, if you want me to go into sort of a, a historical reasons. I just put this in mind. At no time, in the history, indeed, of Northern Ireland, and not just of the Troubles, at no time has the majority of the Catholic nationalist people in Northern Ireland ever supported Republican armed struggle. I know the armed struggle because it is a dramatic and people are killed and just lots of coverage and, and all the rest of it. You know, sort of it's much more newsworthy than the dull, plodding business sort of, of ordinary bourgeois polit politics. Uh, I, the armed struggle is very dramatic and a lot of people stood by, members of the IRA, Sinn Féin's uh, a, a military wing at that time. A lot of people stood by them because they were nationalists. Many people supported the armed struggle through gritted teeth. But certainly there never was solid majority support among the Catholic nationalists of Northern Ireland for a, a, a strategy of violence to bring about a United Ireland or anything else. So in a way, when we talk about the adaptations that Sinn Féin has made, the contribution to the peace process and the adaptations that they have made in that uh, context, I mean, to their attitudes to the British royal family, you should keep in mind that this isn't such a, uh, in terms of abandoning the armed struggle and so forth, to an objective observer, this is something which has been sort of in the making, beginning to happen sort of uh, uh, over a long number of years. This has been the culmination of it. This has been the ceremonial confirmation 
of that relationship uh, between the leadership of Sinn Féin and the British establishment generally. And and uh, Eamon, in, in terms of the evolution of the the move of the of the movement to to free Northern Ireland to reunite with Ireland, what do you see at the at the prospects now, uh, especially now with the changes in the monarchy, with the Brexit, uh, with the Brexit vote that has made uh, more difficulties uh, with the United King with the United Kingdom and 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 Northern Ireland being within the United Kingdom? What are the prospects that you see? for the North reuniting with the Irish Republic? Well, the honest answer is that I don't know, and what's more, neither does anybody else. I mean, there is a a, a great confidence among a nationalist and Republican leaders in the Northern Ireland that we are now moving inexorably towards a United Ireland and you know, a redrawing of all the constitutional boundaries sort of on the island of Ireland. If you're asking me personally, I dissent from that. I don't believe that it's going to be that smooth at all. I don't think if you look... You know, Irish people tend to look and history, sort of look at their own situation, sort of uh, uh, in terms of very long history, going back uh, uh, hundreds of years. I heard a nationalist politician talking a few uh, months ago, and somebody said about the trouble starting, and he responded from the platform, the trouble started when Cromwell landed. You know, it's a, a, a lot of people see it like that, you know, and uh, it's a... a, a it, whether the United Ireland comes about will depend an awful lot on relations between Catholics and Protestants, nationalists and unionists here in uh, Northern Ireland, to the extent to which they are ameliorated. One thing we can say that the idea of using armed struggle, using violence, or to coerce the Protestant community in the North into a United Ireland, that's gone. That's not going to happen uh, anymore. The people who are advocating that and carrying that out have realised that it was never possible and have abandoned it for constitutional politics. And what's happened in the last couple of days is confirmation of the sort of a uh, formalisation sort of of, the, of the, a, that attitude. And we'll have to see what happens. There's a number of things to keep in mind here, but one of them is, and I just mentioned this one, as I mentioned at the beginning, the people in England, Scotland and Wales, including the political leaders of Britain, including the Conservative Party, whether well, very right wing and patriotic and the rest of it, they do not regard any part or any section of the Northern Irish people as an integral element sort of in, in British citizenship. So, and that's going to be very difficult so as that becomes, it has already over the last couple of days become more clear, but spelt out uh, for people. How the unionist population, a unionist day, uh, uh, there are sort of intransigent unionists as there are intransigent in everything. Whether they are going to weaken or soften their attitudes remain to be seen. I doubt it. I doubt it. But let's wait and see. Eamon McCann, we want to thank you so much for being with us. Journalist, activist in Derry, Northern Ireland. Eamon is a former member of the Northern Ireland Assembly, also took part in the march on Bloody Sunday in 1972, helped form the Bloody Sunday Trust, author of the recently republished book, War and an Irish Town. Next up, The Storm is Here, an American Crucible. We'll speak with The New Yorker's award-winning war correspondent, Luke Mogelson. He's been in Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq, but he's talking about the war at home as he writes about right-wing extremism and the 2020 elections. Stay with us. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we spend the rest of the hour with Luke Mogelson, the New Yorker's award-winning war correspondent who covered the wars in Afghanistan and Syria and Iraq before he returned to the United States in 2020 to write about right-wing extremism. 
He was there on January 6th. He is the one who filmed the footage that later went viral, showing Trump supporters forcing their way into the Senate chamber. Before Luke Mogelson went to Washington, D.C., on January 6, 2021, he'd already been following some of the Proud Boys, Oath Keepers and Three Percenters who were there that day. He started his reporting in Michigan on militant right-wing anti-mask militias. He lays out what he found in his new book, just published this week, titled The Storm is Here, an American Crucible. Previously, Luke was based in Kabul as a contributing writer for The New York Times Magazine. He's won two National Magazine Awards, two George Polk Awards. Luke Mogelson, welcome back to Democracy Now! Let's begin in Owosso, Michigan. Um, talk about the protest on April 30, 2020, in the Michigan Capitol, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, what happened and why you feel um, here you have covered wars abroad for many years. It is critical to start here in understanding what's happening in this country now. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. Uh, yeah, in, in April of 2020, um, I had actually just returned home uh, to Paris, where I was living at the time, from an assignment in, in Syria, where I had been uh, uh, reporting on the destruction uh, of the city of Raqqa uh, subsequent to uh, American bombardments. Um, and so I and and that uh, level of of destruction was really shocking to me, even in the context of uh, other uh, American offensives that I'd reported on. And, you know, just over the years, there had always been this kind of troubling disconnect between uh, the violence that I uh, witnessed repeatedly perpetrated by the United States uh, in other countries um, and the relative peace and prosperity uh, back home uh, domestically, where uh, most of the country seemed to be entirely insulated from any kind of consequences or ramifications from uh, what was really uh, unprecedented, um, unprecedented uh, modern uh, destruction of other uh, societies and 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 uh, and communities. So when I saw you know militarized uh, groups uh, occupying an American state house uh, with. Uh, automatic or semi-automatic rifles and flak jackets and helmets accosting lawmakers. Um, that seemed to be perhaps uh, an echo of some of the uh, tend uh, tendencies in, in our country that I'd been reporting on abroad. And I wanted to see what that was about. So I flew to Michigan uh, in early May. And uh, look, uh, it's interesting that you made that decision uh, back at that that period of time. I, I recall on a show on Democracy Now! in a conversation with Amy, I was also struck at the time by these uh, armed protests that were anti-COVID protests. And I want to remind readers, I said back then that the, t I saw Trump uh, really praising these folks as wonderful Americans. And and uh, and I I said at the time, I think it was on April 21st. I don't think we should discount the possibility that this president will declare an election that he loses as a fraud and illegitimate an attempt to stay in power. You know, some people mm -hmm. may say this is far-fetched. I hope it is. But I think mm -hmm. that we shouldn't delude ourselves that we're living in extraordinary times in the United States, because those armed protests were an indication to me that something major was happening in this country. Uh, and I'm wondering, as you began to cover these, uh, the folks in these protests, what you came away from in, in Michigan and these other places, Pennsylvania, as to uh, what was uh, propelling uh, folks to resort to arms in, uh, in protests against the government? 
Mm -hmm. Well, that was very perspicacious of you. I don't know if uh, I anticipated um, th this evolving into what it eventually became at that point. Um, but I was surprised when I arrived in Michigan by the just the the, the frequency, the level of of outrage already. And remember, this is before uh, George Floyd was killed. It's before the election, before uh, even really the campaign. Um, and already you had uh, large groups of people uh, up in arms over uh, these public health policies. Um, and it, it was and and you also had um, mainstream Republicans uh, on the national level and also the state level um, embracing and uh, endorsing this uh, their outrage and and telling them that they were they were justified um, and 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 right to be um, to feel that they were victims of of a, an egregious. Uh, persecution and, and oppression. You know, after that initial um, that initial rally uh, at the Michigan State Capitol in Lansing, the state Senate leader, who's a Republican, uh, Mike Shirky, and relatively mainstream, uh, he condemned uh, both the Michigan Liberty Militia and the American Patriot Council, who organized um, the occupation of the Capitol. Um, and he called them uh, a bunch of jackasses and uh, disavowed their their use of uh, violence and the threat of violence to intimidate lawmakers. Well, a couple weeks later, later uh, Shirky seemed to realize which way the wind was blowing and uh, actually appeared uh, with those exact same groups uh, on stage at a rally in, in Grand Rapids and told them, uh, we need you now more than ever. And I was there for that and was was just uh, kind of stunned by uh, the 180 degree reversal that the senator was was willing to uh, to publicly uh, make. And some of those people that he appeared on stage with, by the way, ended up uh, in the mob that stormed the U.S. Capitol on, on January 6th. I wanted to go to that moment, uh, to turn to your harrowing footage of the Capitol insurrection that The New Yorker published, showing how this violent mob broke through police lines, pounded on locked doors of the Capitol, shouting treason, and breached the Senate chambers, looking for lawmakers to confront. We see a group of white men rifling through Senate papers, the uh, President Trump and efforts by Republican senators Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz to overturn the Electoral College college vote, pose for selfies, stand on the Senate dais for a prayer led by QAnon conspiracy theorist Jacob Shansley. Um, this is an extended excerpt from the video filmed by you, Luke Mogelson, on January 6th. <laughs>
There's gotta be something in here. We can f use against these scumbags. I think we're good. Hey, man. Glad to see you guys. You guys are patriots. Look at this guy. He's got covered in blood. God bless you. Yes. You good, sir? Do you need medical attention? I'm good. Thank you. You all right? I got shot in the face. Where are they? I got shot in the face with some kind of plastic bullet. Any chance I could get you guys yeah. to leave the Senate wing? We will. I've been making sure they ain't disrespecting the place. Okay, just want to let you guys know this is like the sacredest place. Jesus Christ! We can fuck your name! Amen! Amen! Let's all say a prayer in this sacred space. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for gracing us with this opportunity. Thank you. Let me take a bite. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Amen. We're going to leave it here, and that's uh, this white mob attacking, I think it's AP's media equipment, and talking about CNN. Before that, you see mm -hmm. the QAnon conspiracy theorist Jacob Chansley take off his horns on the Senate dais to lead prayer. So I was wondering if you could talk, Luke Mogelson, about how you were accepted by them to film the in the midst of them. Did you climb through the window to get there, um, and then talk? Talk about them praying, not to mention attacking everything they saw. Uh, yeah, well, as far as um, how I was able to record that video, um, it, it was surprisingly easy, actually, uh, just because so many of the rioters themselves were uh, taking selfies and filming. And, um, you know, there was a real uh, performative quality uh, to the attempted insurrection uh, in which I really had the sense that um, they were um, enacting uh, a, a kind of demonstration of dominance over their adversary for one another and for uh, themselves. And this is something you know that you see in all kinds of mob violence uh, throughout history. Um, and uh, I think that that was most kind of vividly on display inside the Senate chamber uh, with Jacob Chansley, as you mentioned, taking off his horns and, and standing at the dais and leading everybody in prayer. Um, you know, he was clearly um, hamming it up. Uh, and, and even, you know, when he saw me uh, filming with my phone uh, at one point, you know, w was directing uh, some of his oratory <laughs> towards towards me and the camera. Uh, he also handed his phone to 
uh, another rioter and asked him to take pictures of him flexing his biceps while sitting in the vice president's chair. Um, so, you know, they weren't by any means um, uh, reluctant to be filmed. On the contrary, you know, they were eager to have uh, their actions, which they sincerely believed were righteous, uh, documented um, both for uh, themselves and and for uh, other Americans who uh, who shared their their worldviews. Um, and as far as uh, your question about the prayer and the and the religious uh, aspect of of the violence, that also was quite striking to me. Um, inside the Senate chamber uh, at one point, you know, after uh, rec- after thanking God and and Jesus. Uh, for allowing them to uh, a- achieve this victory. Um, th- one of the rioters uh, yelled out, this is how uh, Trump gets elected. And I think, again, some of them really believed that. Um, on January 5th, the day before uh, the riot, there had been speeches uh, on uh, uh, Freedom Plaza uh, and Roger Stone had told a lot of the Trump supporters who had come to D.C. and who would the next day uh, storm the Capitol that this was uh, nothing less than a battle between uh, light and dark, the godly and the godless. And um, and I and I do believe that that's how uh, many of the participants in the insurrection uh, viewed their actions. Um, not as a political act, but as um, as something taking place mm-hmm. in a more timeless kind of cosmic uh, spiritual uh, framework. Well, look, we, we only have about a, a minute or so left, but I wanted to, if you could go back before January 6th, in your book, you talk about the uh, the protest, uh, the November 7th protest at the Pennsylvania State Capitol in Harrisburg, where you began to first realize that there could be violence. This was a stop the steal uh, uh, rally that occurred there. I'm wondering if you could talk about that and and uh, the, the fervor that drove some of uh, these folks around the issue, uh, the bogus issue that the election was stolen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as that was the day that uh, all of the national news networks called the election for Biden, and you had a, a large gathering of Trump supporters, uh, many of them belonging to uh, the Pennsylvania three percenter militia, are heavily armed uh, at the state capitol in Harrisburg. And the moment the election was called, um, they were already calling for violence, and and not just them, uh, by the way, but elected officials as well. Uh, Dan, Congressman Dan Mauser was there, uh, Doug Mastriano was there, uh, other uh, Trump campaign surrogates were there, and, um, and there was just no question that they were going to accept the results of the election. But it wasn't just November 7th, it went back to you know previous rallies, even uh, before all of the results had come in, uh, in, in in various swing states, which I witnessed, for example, in Detroit on election day, there was a mob at the TCF convention center. We have ten um, seconds, Luke. Yeah, so uh, it, 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 January six was not a surprise. It was it was uh, it was foretold. And of course, Mastrano is running for governor of Pennsylvania right now, the Republican candidate. Luke Mogelson, The New Yorker's award winning war correspondent. His new book, out this week, is titled The Storm Is Here An American Crucible. And that does it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe.